Section 47 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 44 Northumberland at the Time of the Civil War. During the stormy days of King Charles I, the borders, and especially Northumberland, saw many stirring scenes. It must be remembered that shortly before the Long Parliament was elected, King Charles almost came to war with the Scottish Presbyterians, because they would not obey the harsh rule of Archbishop Lord. The Scots raised an army under the lead of shrewd General Alexander Leslie, the old, little, crooked soldier of great experience, trained by the great Gustavus of Sweden. In 1639, Charles sent ships up to the Forth, in reply to which Leslie marched his army to threaten the border. The old quarrel between the two countries began to blaze up again. King Charles led an army to the border and was received with splendid applause at Newcastle. Many joined his army and shouted with joy at the thought of meeting the Scots in battle. But they were an untrained, disorderly crew who fired off their guns at random and kept no military order whatever. Gallant Leslie marched his men down to Dunn's Law in South Berwickshire and was ready to fight. But King Charles would not trust his army that length. He made terms with his opponents, promising them the reforms they set their hearts upon, and the two armies melted away like schoolboys at the end of the term. Things were soon as bad as before. Lord Conway was sent by the King to put Newcastle into a strong defensive state. His greatest difficulty was to get money for the purpose, for the King's quarrel with his various parliaments had deprived him of supplies. The badly paid troops mutinied, and the ringleader was shot. Very soon the Scottish army came across the Tweed, the Highlanders armed with bows and arrows. They pitched their camp on Hedden Law, and soon proved to the country folk that they had not come for plunder, but would pay for all they wanted to eat. This reassured the country people, who had no real quarrel with the Scots, and even became most friendly to them. With Lord Conway it was otherwise. He was the King's officer, and was bound to offer resistance. His opinion was that if once the Scots crossed the Tyne and attacked Newcastle from the south or Gateshead side, they were sure of victory. Accordingly, leaving a strong garrison to protect the town. He marched out with 2,000 or more foot and fully 1,000 horse to command the important ford across the Tyne at Newburn, a place five or six miles due west of Newcastle. It is interesting to remember that here also the Romans had had fortifications along the line of the wall, and the very spot where the Scots and English fought may well have been the scene of contests between the Roman legions and the wild Picts. The English arrived first on the south bank of the river and threw up earthworks hastily. Very soon they saw the Scots march into Newburn village on the north bank, where they employed themselves by hauling their cannon up to the church tower. Remarkable cannon they were, made out of bar iron hooped together with cord and wet raw hides but they were not required to carry any distance. The foe was only on the other side of the Tyne. All the morning the enemies looked at one another across the river, each hesitating to fire the first shot of the war. At last an English officer shot a Scotch officer, and the fight began. The Scots were on the higher ground, and their cannon, rough as they were, sent heavy shot onto the English. Then. When the river tide went down, the Scots rushed across the ford, and the battle was soon won, the royal standard being taken. English runaways rushed through the woods and into Newcastle, crying, Fly for your lives! Naked devils have destroyed us! Whether they referred to kilted highlanders is uncertain. Anyway, Leslie and his Scots entered Newcastle in triumph, but were afterwards bought off with a payment of £60,000 and recrossed the Tweed into Scotland. In 
This was in 1641, a year in which King Charles was quarrelling bitterly with his long parliament, though the actual civil war in England did not begin until 1642. Early in 1642, it was decided that so important a town as Newcastle ought to be put in a stronger state of defence. William Cavendish, Earl of Newcastle, was made governor of the town, but he was much hindered in his plans by lack of money. King Charles, however, promoted him from Earl to Marquis of Newcastle, and the lack of funds he made up as best he was able. However, the governor of Holy Island, off the Northumberland shore, found himself left for sixteen months without any pay. He wrote to the king's treasury a protest in verse, beginning, The great commander of the cormorants, the geese and ganders of these hallowed lands, where Lindisfarne and Holy Island stands, these worthless lines sends to your worthy hands. The allusion in the first two lines is to the fact that Holy Island and the Farne Islands were then, and are still today, so thinly peopled that seabirds gather there in large numbers, adding greatly to the wild beauty of these islets and rocks. In January 1644, a serious struggle began. Leslie and his soldiers crossed the Tweed at Berwick Bridge and again entered Northumberland. General Bailey marched his men from Kelso across the frozen river and joined Leslie at Annick. Walkworth Castle, though it contained cannon and provisions, surrendered at once. The Scottish general gravely told Bemerton, the governor, that if he had learnt to fight as well as he had learnt to dance, his castle could never have been taken. The country districts of Northumberland had no quarrel with the Scots, and it was soon evident that the real fight would be at Newcastle, bravely held by the Marquis and by the Mayor, Sir John Marley. The Scottish murthering pieces, as the cannon were called, were brought down by sea, and the obstinate conflict began. Despite the terrible weather of a very rough February, frequent skirmishes took place, while the Scots closed nearer and nearer round the gallantly defended town. Leslie soon found that the defences had been put into good order. The ditch round the town was dug deep and close to the walls. The walls themselves were strongly underpinned. The battlements were strengthened by stone and lime, but the top stones were loosened so as to slip if the enemy attempted to mount them. Every cannon was placed carefully to the best advantage. But the Marquis of Newcastle was called southwards by the needs of his king. With him were his thousand brave white coats, so called because they wore white coats, which they promised to dye in the blood of the enemy. But they met the terrible Ironsides at Marston Moor, and in a conflict of furious bravery on both sides, all of the gallant thousand except thirty were slain on the field of battle. This was in July of 1644, but it did not affect the siege of Newcastle, which still dragged obstinately on under the skilful guidance of the dauntless mayor. By October, Sir John Marley was so buoyed up by his success that he sent a letter to General Leslie to ask if he was still alive. This the Scots took to be an insult, and a grand assault was begun. The Scots were furious and the defence was desperate, the roar of the cannon and the rattle of the musketry were succeeded, as the assault got nearer and nearer to its aim, by the clashing of swords and the clanging of pikes. At last, the regiments of Loudoun and Buccleu succeeded in forcing their way into the town. In vain the defendants made their last gallant charge. Their cause was now hopeless, and soon the marketplace was filled with fugitives, who flung down their arms and cried aloud for quarter at the hands of the triumphant Scots. In these days, the defender was often made to feel the anger of the victors, who in the flush and cruelty of victory avenged their dead only too terribly upon the losing side. Not so at Newcastle. Prominent in its day, it stands out because of the mercy of the Scottish conquerors as much as for the heroism of its defence. 
In this, the last great struggle on English ground between Scots and English, it is pleasing indeed to recall facts that redound to the high honour of both parties. End of section 47